and welcome everybody once again. My name is Benji Cohn. Welcome to our 53rd episode of the Moss program. So who we are and what we're doing is we started this program during the pandemic just to, as a way to reach out to people and talk about interesting topics that are coming up and in the near future. So if you're looking for something to do in the next week or two, this is a program to tune in and learn how to do that. Obviously, we do it on Wednesdays, starting right at noon. It is 12.01 right now, so we run for about 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take some Q&A after that. And our goal is just to learn about hunting, fishing, outdoor recreation opportunities we have across the state of Minnesota, and share how the DNR manages our state's wild lands and wildlife, and give any tips on how you can be stewards of our shared natural resources. And besides today's great program, uh, coming up, Corey's going to talk about rough fish. Uh, we're going to do some sharp tail grouse talk uh, next week. Then we're doing a Becoming Outdoor Woman's event on steelheading. And we've got a couple of 4-H shooting sports programs in there. And then wild rice management coming up in April. And then a, a favorite, I think is going to be a favorite. Our fishing ones are always popular. The DNR staff, expert fishing lures, our favorite lures. We're going to talk about that May 11th and then walleye fishing for beginners, and then the ever-growing sport, ever-popular sport of youth fishing leagues. So hope you stick around and join us in the, in the following weeks here, and, and we'll have more stuff announced for the summer as, uh, as we get closer. So I think with that, Corey, I'd like to welcome Corey Geving. He's the co-founder of roughfish.com, uh, super knowledgeable in everything rough fish related, and this is a great... Uh, segue into spring as as you learn from Corey. Spring is a great time to get out there and start targeting some of these species. So I think with that, Corey, I'll pass it over to you and, and you can introduce yourself. Thanks. So my name is Corey Geving. As uh, Benji said, I co-founded the roughfish.com website back in 1998. Uh, it's a website devoted to uh, just educating people about our uh, underutilized non-traditional sport fish is what I like to call them. Um, I'm a native fish advocate, speaker, and consultant, and I have spent most of my life trying to track down and catch rare and strange species of fish that a lot of people haven't heard of. I've caught almost every large species of fish in Minnesota on hook and line. And uh, I've been involved in this uh, with, a, with a pretty good group of uh, fellow anglers for uh, at least 20 years. Um, and I did want to point out this is an angling presentation, so I'm going to be covering hook and line methods. Uh, I know there was some question about uh, netting and spearing and bow fishing. I'm not an expert on that, so I'll just be covering hook and line and uh, the DNR, I'm sure, can uh, arrange. The, I'm sure there are other seminars about the other methods. So first off, what's a rough fish? Where did that word come from? Well, it's unclear. It sort of just emerged many years ago. Uh, it's possible that it came from the word from the term coarse fish, which came over from Europe. Um, but essentially, it became a, a derogatory term for fish we don't value. And who we is obviously varies from region to region and from culture to culture. So. You got people that are from Louisiana in the Cajun country. They uh, they don't consider a, a sheephead a rough fish, but uh, people in uh, Minnesota and Iowa do. So it really varies from region to region. And a lot of these fish have been scorned for many decades. And uh, in the past, it was considered a good biology to try to exterminate them. One example of this is uh, the Green River in Wyoming, at, back in 1962, they poisoned the whole river trying to uh, get rid of all the rough fish. But nowadays, they've reversed that, and it's uh, they're they're thriving. Times are changing and and fast. Most of these fish are beneficial native fish, and they're rapidly being recognized and accepted for the awesome sport fish that they are. So this slide, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go over these in detail, but essentially this just communicates the way that attitudes are changing about these fish all across the United States. Um, great 
uh, rough fish advocates on social media. Recently, there was a uh, episode of meat meat eater or uh, B side fishing about them. Uh, Field and Stream magazine did a big uh, article, and uh, even the uh, culinary magazine Bon Appetit did a social media video about uh, a non traditional sport fish uh, cuisine, which is really cool. But this map just generally shows you how. Boy, every year new new uh, clubs and groups are emerging for these underutilized fishes, and uh, more and more states are starting to regulate and uh, respect these these fishes. So why is this happening? Why is there a growing interest in angling for the non traditional sport fishes? Well, first of all, they're they're just big, beautiful fish, and they're fun to catch. I mean, a lot of the fun of fishing is just fighting and landing a big cool fish and uh, that's that's what you got with the with the uh, rough fishes there uh, the average angler isn't going to handle that many five or ten pound fish you know in a in a typical day of fishing but boy if you're fishing for buffalo carp and and red horse you can you can measure your fish in pounds and get a and get a good fight out of them Another reason that this type of fishing is popular is in some cases it requires a lot less gear and technology. And I know a lot of us love our gear. We, we love our boats and and all that. Um, but a, a lot of people don't want to maintain a big expensive boat and and have to upgrade their their five thousand dollar sonar every year and and uh, you know all the all the technology and and maintenance that goes with that. While some of that is is really useful for types of some types of rough fishing, there's also very simple. There's a there's a simplicity to the sport where you can take a fishing rod and a pair of sneakers and wade around in a stream and, and have a blast catching fish. Um, a lot of these waters where rough fish are popular are uh, free of competition at least now, and obviously this is changing, but. You can find a beautiful stretch of river and have it almost all to yourself. I know that many anglers are are frustrated with how crowded the trout streams and, and good walleye lakes are. So fishing for these fish is a way to get out in nature and, and really get some solitude and enjoy the beauty by yourself. Another reason people really like these fish is it's an ecologically friendly source of meat. These fish haven't been overexploited like a lot of the really popular fishes. So you can really get a, a successful foraging outing for fish. Um, and these fish are often delicious. They sometimes take a little extra effort to fillet, but they are a really um, good target for you if you wanna get a, a source of foraged meat. Now these next two points are kind of opposites, but it's it's completely true. Uh, on one hand, there's easy targets for beginners. If you're just getting going in fishing, you know you can get by with uh, a very simple outfit and catch a fish on almost every cast. If you want to go after simple fish like bullheads and white suckers and and carp, um, but on the other hand, there's difficult challenges for experts. I I can count on one or two hands the number of people I know that have caught a blue sucker or a, an American eel. You know, you can, you can try fly fishing for carp, which is another big challenge. So uh, there's difficult challenge for expert fishermen and there's also very simple things for rank beginners. Uh, it's great for getting kids into the sport. I know when I was a kid getting up at four in the morning to Go out in the rain and walleye chop for uh, some back trolling was was not as fun as it could be, especially if the fish weren't, you know, were few and far between. But you can get some kids out, get them, get a bend in their rod, and and they'll get hooked on the sport really quickly if they're exposed to, you know, some fast action for big, cool, beautiful fish. So it's only natural that eventually these these fish were going to be rediscovered.
Trying to go to the next slide here. It's not wanting it to. There we go. Okay. So what does Minnesota have to offer? Well, there's an incredible diversity of fishes here in the state, and it it's almost more than any other state. And I'm not entirely sure if that's. I mean, I don't know that we can compete with the ocean states, but as far as landlocked freshwater fishes, Minnesota is really amazing. Uh, we have a lot of varied water. We have Lake Superior, this giant deep cold water fishery. We've got the lower Mississippi and its backwaters, which are, you know, full of warm water species like gar and bowfin and buffalo. Uh, there's hard to find species like, you know, the, the blue sucker, the long nose sucker. And uh, there's really good water access. I know I've traveled all over the country um, chasing down some of these hard to catch fish species. And boy, a lot of states, you know, it, it, you can travel hundreds of miles between chance places where the public has the right to go fishing. But here in Minnesota, if you drive down a, a typical highway, you'll find places to go fishing every every few miles. It's it's really amazing, and we're very lucky to live here. So for the next section, I'm going to talk about Minnesota rough fishing opportunities. Uh, I'm going to go down species by species. So I'll be talking about uh, some of the really common ones that are found almost everywhere, and then I'll point out a few of the the rare ones that are uh, maybe only found in a limited area or aren't very common at all. So first off, we've got the bowfin, also known as a dogfish. Um, this is a familiar fish to people who spend a lot of time bass fishing because they will sometimes take bass lures. This is a predatory fish um, that feeds on just about anything. It'll take, uh, you know, frogs, crayfish, uh, minnows, they, they eat uh, sunfish, and they can definitely, they're known to help improve sunfish populations by uh, keeping them from stunting. So to catch this fish, uh, baits, including cut bait, are a good, are a good um, bait to use. So where uh, you can always use um, rough fish for cut bait such as bullheads. You have to check the regulations though, because that varies with the water. Make sure you're uh, following the regs. Uh, minnows, flies, lures, and soft plastics. I know uh, hooking into a bowfin on a fly rod is, is an absolute thrill. You're talking about a fish that can pull harder than a bass and it'll tail walk and jump and even leap onto land to fight you sometimes. And this fish has, is an ancient fish. It has a primitive lung. Um, so they, uh, in the summer, they, they come up to the uh, surface to breathe air occasionally. So one of the best ways to locate this fish, if you're targeting them, is to uh, walk along the shore or paddle along the shore looking for the rounded snouts of the bowfin as they poke their head out of the water to take a gulp of air. Um, and once you see that, you can then target them with a lure or a bait. One of the really interesting things about this fish is that uh, they guard their nests fiercely in the, in the springtime. The males develop bright green fins and they, uh, they'll chase away any other fish. And the, uh, the minnow known as the golden shiner will capitalize on that by laying its eggs in the bowfin nest. And the bowfin then inadvertently protects the golden shiners and helps the young golden shiners grow up. Overall, this is just a big, bad, toothy, ancient fish. Um, catching these is one of the one of the funnest fisheries we have in the state. You can see from the map they're found all throughout the central part of the state. So, if you've got a, a good bowfin lake near you, that's something you really need to capitalize on. Next, I'm going to go over the two species of gar we have in the state of Minnesota. First of all, the the larger of the two is the long nosed gar. You can see from the map. There's a small population up in west central Minnesota, and beyond that, they're mostly in the in the big rivers, the Minnesota, St. Croix, and the uh, Mississippi, along with a few uh, lakes further inland. You can see from the long, thin, bony snout, these fish are hard to hook, uh, so people have developed alternate methods to land them. Uh, one of them is the rope fly. You can see in the center there, you can just tie a bit of frayed rope to a 
to a uh, swivel and uh, jerk that through the water and the gar will take it for a bait fish and snap at it and their teeth become tangled in that rope and you can land the fish just from that entanglement. There's no hook on that lure. It's just got rope to entangle it. So that's a really fun way to do that. And you, you can either use a fly rod or just a regular spinning reel and fish the uh, rope fly like a, like you would a plastic worm for bass. Uh, live bait will also work. Minnows are a good, uh, good choice. These fish tend to hang around uh, woody structure, vegetation and docks. So you can see them, uh, stacked up along fallen trees, oftentimes in the big rivers like the Mississippi. And if you're not using rope flies, just uh, using live bait and hooks, you know, a 10% hookup to landing ratio is pretty good for long nose gar, but that really isn't a big deal. I know I've gone out and, and hooked and lost 10 different long nose gar in an evening and had each of one jump and throw the hook and it's a, it's a thrilling sport, whether you really, whether you land them or not. Second gar is a short nose gar. This is a, uh, oh, and by the way, both of these gar fish are also uh, air breathers like the bowfin. So on warm summer days, you can sometimes spot by uh, looking for surfacing gar. Short nose gar has a wide toothy bill. It looks more like a duck's bill as opposed to in tweezer mouth of the long nose gar. Because of that, they're easier to hook. These fish will forage in very shallow water at night. Um, so you can see the lady with the short nose on the left there has got a headlamp for uh, spotting the fish at night so that she can cast a, a spinner or a minnow at them. Uh, MEP spinners are a really good uh, option for short nose gar. And as you can see from the map, they're mainly in the bigger rivers in the connected uh, lakes and backwaters in the southern half of the state. Next, I'm going to go over the red horse. These are in the sucker family. There's actually six different species of red horse in Minnesota. We are just a red horse mecca here. It's a, it's a great fishery. Um, I've got a, at roughfish.com, we've developed the slam system for red horse. It's a angling achievement where you try to catch as many different types in one day. So you get the red horse slam for having three, caught three species in a day. The Grand Slam for four species and the elusive Red Horse Super Slam is when you can catch five or more species in a single day, which I've only seen that done a few times, but it's a, it's a pretty amazing accomplishment. Now, these fish can be hard to identify uh, sometimes. Once you've handled a few of them, it, it becomes easy, but uh, there's a free ID cheat sheets at moxastoma.com, which is a, a website devoted to Red Horse. Um, you can see a, there's an image here. You can print out a little copy of this cheat sheet, and then you can identify any of the uh, red horse that you catch. So I'll go over the six species of red horse next. First is the shorthead red horse. This is, a, as you can see from the map, they're found throughout the entire state. They're a beautiful fish. Um, I've, you know, guided anglers from other countries, from Europe and um, from uh, the UK, they're just amazed at how, how gorgeous these fish are. They just have bright red tail and silvery sides and just an amazing looking fish. They're really abundant in this state. So almost every river has a good population of them. And you can, the best way to identify them is looking at the mouth. You can see the uh, mouth of these fish is tiny. So you should use small hooks and worms. Um, larva, insect larvae are a good bait too. Um, the biggest mistake people make with this fish is using too big of a hook. Um, generally, if you're fishing with uh, anything above a size two, you're not going to catch these fish. You're just going to get a ton of tapping bites and you'll never hook one. So if that's happening to you on a river, just scale down your hook and you should have better success. Second one is the golden red horse. This is one of, probably my favorite of all the red horse species. It's found almost everywhere in the state, really common. Uh, they're delicious. I, uh, this is one of my favorite red horses for the table. And it took me years to notice this, but they're leapers. If you uh, hook a, a sucker in a river and it jumps or splashes almost immediately after being hooked, 
90% of the time, that's a golden red horse. Very widespread, found in, in small warm water uh, rivers. And uh, there's also a small group of anglers who have uh, learned how to fish them through the ice by uh, just sawing a hole in, a, in, in the ice and uh, fishing them um, through the ice. The third um, red horse, and this is the last of the really common ones, is the silver. Um, and these are uh, one of the most common big fish that you can find in Minnesota's rivers. And they're a great eating fish. Uh, they have some extra bones that you have to work around, but it's definitely worth it. They're, uh, they're really great eating. They're extremely hard fighters. They get up to 10 pounds in weight and they live in the current. So you're you're definitely getting a good battle out of them. And their spawning runs that happen in the spring, they uh, will migrate to riffle areas and stack up in these shallow riffles where you will almost think you're in an Alaskan river during the, sa the salmon run when, when you see that the number of fish that are piled up spawning. And it's, it's just a great spring spectacle. Uh, it starts in uh, mid-April, but uh, by the time it's usually going in full force by mid-May, at least in the southern part of the state. And as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the can't miss fishing opportunities that we have in Minnesota. So the, up, the remaining three red horse are more rare, a little harder to find. Uh, the first is the river red horse. This is a big, big headed fish. It, uh, it feeds on uh, mussels and clams on the, on the river bottom. Typically, people will fish for them with worms, shrimp, or uh, even canned spam will work. And uh, these fish live in heavy current, and they're a big river fighter. As you can see from the map, it's the St. Croix, the Mississippi, and uh, some of the tributaries of, this, of, the, of those two rivers are the uh, main places where you can find them. These are just tremendous fighters. And the final, or uh, Second to the last uh, red horse is the crater. This is the largest red horse in the state. I think the biggest one recorded is over 15 pounds. Uh, they can occur in very small streams, though. You can uh, you can catch graters in in some pretty small waters all throughout the central part of the state and in the the southeast. Um, good baits for these are crayfish, shrimp, and night crawlers. And there's definitely a fall migration where they drop back into wintering holes. And that's that's something that all the red horse do. Um, so in addition to that spring spawning run, there's also a, a great fall fishery. As you can see in this photo of me um, with the grader on the left, I'm wearing a stocking cap because that's that's mid to late October. And of course the last red horse is the black red horse, which the red horse scientists are renaming the dusky red horse because clearly that fish is not black. It's, it's just got kind of a dusky sheen to it. Um, this is a southern uh, fish. It's found in the Ozarks mostly, but there's a small population of them in southeast Minnesota. They're just a beautiful fish. You can see on the, in the upper right there, that photograph catches just this emerald-like iridescent color of the scales in these fish. Um, they top out at about two pounds and uh, are found in pretty small waters. Uh, they're poorly understood, but uh, you can you can encounter them in the uh, the Root River and the Zumbro River. So after covering some of the most common fish in the state, I just have to bring up the American eel. Um, these are just one of the most amazing fishes in the world. Um, What's amazing about them is that this is an ocean fish. So the American, all of the American eels are born out in the Saragosso Sea um, by Bermuda in the ocean. And the, the baby eels swim to the Mississippi River where they divide up. The males stay near the mouth of the river, but the female eels swim up the entire Mississippi River to Minnesota and you can actually fish for them here. I don't know, it's the only way I think you can catch an ocean fish in Minnesota. 
Uh, so obviously these are all the fish, by the time they get all the way up here, they're adult, large female eels. Um, most of the ones that I see caught are in mid-October. For some reason, they, they move. Nobody really understands what they're doing or why, um, but they like deep cover, riprap, um, wooden snags, and they, uh, they feed on cut bait, shad, night crawlers, typically at night. And uh, these are amazing you know, five foot long, heavy, hard fighting fish and an extremely unique uh, challenge for a for an expert angler. Another pair of uh, feisty little fish is the moon eye and gold eye. Um, these are known as bony tongued fish. You can see in the upper left corner, there's a picture of a, uh, the mouth of, of these fish where you can see the, the teeth they have on their tongue. You can tell that this is a this is a predatory fish. They eat small minnows and insects, um, so they're a, they're a really fun fish to fly fish for. Uh, you can see from the map they're found in the uh, rivers all over the state. I know that there's a fantastic population in the uh, in the uh, Red River or the uh, I'm sorry the Red Lake River. They're in the uh, Cannon and Root and the Minnesota River. Uh, you look for areas of steady deep current, uh, and one of the one of the interesting things about this fish is the well these two fish, specifically the gold eye, uh, has been made into a delicacy by the folks up in Winnipeg who make Winnipeg smoked gold eye, which is kind of like a like a fish spread, that's a delicacy they uh, they eat up there, and they love it so much they even name their minor league baseball team the Winnipeg Gold Eyes. So if you ever get a chance, they have a, they even have a little dancing gold eye uh, mascot for their baseball team. Okay, back to the bigger fish. This is the big mouth buffalo. Um, and this is a, just a really sporty big fish. They feed, unlike the other suckers, their mouth is forward facing. You can see, um, especially in that lower picture, how their mouth faces directly forward. So they feed by sucking in tiny insects, you know, crustaceans and plankton. You want to use small baits generally. They're extremely challenging to catch. They'll sometimes hit uh, small jigs and flies. And there was recently a, an aging study that was done that showed these fish can live to be over 100 years old. Um, so it's, it's uh, catching one of these is a real, uh, it's a real accomplishment. And uh, they're they're tremendous fighters, obviously. I mean, for a fish that can get up to seventy or eighty pounds in size, um, you know that's going to put a bend in your rod. There's a and the second buffalo is the smallmouth buffalo, which looks very similar, but it's kind of a, a round, flat fish, which is how it gets its its other name of uh, blue pancake, just kind of an alternate name for this fish. Uh, that's more of a bottom bottom feeding fish, so worms or dough balls in uh, in big rivers work for them. Here's the burbot or eel pout. Everyone, uh, well, many many ice anglers know of this fish, and this is becoming more and more popular. It's soon to be regulated um, because it's just become people have woken up to the fact that boy, these guys are really delicious. Um, there's a Janu they spawn in January and they are uh, very willing biters during that spawning run. I've had times when I could catch a dozen an hour. Um, there are a few places where you can catch them in open water. I know people who have actually caught them on, on a fly rod. Uh, and people call burbot poor man's lobster, but personally they're so delicious that I think lobster is actually poor man's burbot. Uh, here's carp suckers. There's actually three very similar species. Um, if you want to know how to tell the difference, you can uh, go out to roughfish.com. There's some uh, helpful diagrams out there. And these look a bit like carp, but they're not. They don't have barbels. They're, uh, they have a, a pointed top fin. That's sort of diagnostic. And these are really challenging fish. Uh, they often feed in, in shallow, clear water. They're very spooky. They're really common, but really hard to catch. So 
boy, if you're a, if you're an expert angler and want to get a challenge, get out there and try to catch one of these because this will. I don't know that they make trout look look easy as far as fishing for them in, in uh, clear water and small streams. These two fish, uh, I, I'd like to include these because they show how diverse our Minnesota fisheries are. In the upper right, you've got the spotted sucker, also known as the corn cob sucker. This is a fish that's um, eaten a lot down in Georgia, you know, the Carolinas, Florida, Arkansas. It's a, it's a real southern fish, but you can find them in the backwaters of the Mississippi River. Um, lately, we've been seeing more and more of them in the, uh, in the Root River. And uh, they're, a, they're a pretty good sized fish. They grow to, you know, three or four pounds, typically maybe a bit bigger. And they're really fun to catch. And on the lower left, you've got the long nose sucker, which, and that's also the fish in the lower right, also known as the red side, that uh, lives in Lake Superior and the uh, Red River of the North. And this fish will live in the deep cold waters of Lake Superior and migrate out of the, uh, out of the lake into the tributary streams in the spring. And this is an Arctic fish. It lives in Northern Alaska, the Yukon territories, and you know, all the way down to its southerly extent of its range in, in Minnesota. Here's one of my favorites, the blue sucker. This one I have not caught yet. Um, this is a, uh, a rather rare fish. They used to be one of the more common fishes uh, the dam damming up of our major river systems has uh, caused a decline in this species, but they're really coming back. In the last 10 years, we've been seeing more and more of them. Um, obviously, from the map, you can see the Minnesota River is, is one of the best places to go after them. And then, of course, the main stem, Mississippi. They like fast water. Um, they uh, are helped by dam removals. I've been trying to catch one of these for 35 years. And they're uh, highly migratory. Uh, a typical, you know, spawning migration for this fish might be 600 miles. So you'll have uh, fish from out of state, you know, showing up in Minnesota and then spawning and then disappearing and, and not showing up for another year. So this is a tremendous challenge for anybody who wants to go after a really hard to catch fish. Contrast, here's the white sucker. This is the same fish you see uh, for sale in bait shops as a uh, bait for northern pike and, and walleye. Uh, they're one of the most common fishes in the state. They live almost everywhere. Um, it, small streams and ditches are great places to find them. They spawn in the spring and they, you know, you can catch one after another in a good spot. Look for uh, nice shallow rocky riffles. And these are good, good eating fish, but quite bony. You need to uh, take some extra steps to prepare them, and I'll, I'll go over that in one of the later slides. We have time here. Uh, bullheads. Everybody knows bullheads. Catch them accidentally. They're available almost everywhere. Really good on light tackle. They're good eating. I mean, anybody who's gone to uh, a bullhead fry uh, at, a, at a VFW or a, or a bar and grill anywhere in outstate Minnesota will find really good eating amongst the... Uh, fried bullhead. I wrote an article about this uh, called Trophy Bullhead Waters in Minnesota. You can find that on roughfish.com and that, that helps you find uh, waters where you can look for a specimen bullhead, which is a 15 plus incher. Uh, for some of these fish, I like to use the alternate names because they're, they're just fun and exciting. Uh, black bullheads I like to call stingers. Browns are called marble cats because of their mottled coloration, and uh, yellow bullheads are called greasers because they have kind of a kind of a shiny, greasy look to them, even though they're they're not any more greasy than the other bullheads. I think this might be the last, or this no, there's the second to the last fish are the white and the yellow bass. Um, these are river fish. They live in a few lakes as well. White bass are superb eating, great fighters, and easy to catch. And there's also the yellow bass, which has just appeared in, in uh, Fairmont, Minnesota. There's a chain of lakes in Fairmont. People are traveling hundreds of miles to go fish for those little buggers down there. They're uh, small fish. They get up to about 10 or 12 inches, but they're really good eating and really easy to catch. Uh, you can uh, have a great time catching one after another. 
I was down there this winter and, and we had a blast catching yellow bass. Here's the freshwater drum or sheep's head. Uh, some of the rough fish anglers call them Midwest reds because they're very much like a redfish from the ocean. They're from the drum family, just like the redfish. And just like the redfish, they make grunting sounds that you can hear. They're great eating fish. You know, you can fillet them just like a big crappie. Easy to catch. <clears throat> and, uh, crayfish and shrimp are good baits for them. Here's a cute little bugger, the northern hog sucker. You can see from the close-up they have a they have a black ring around their mouth. Um, that's a diagnostic feature. They live in rocky riffles. They're highly camouflaged, so if you sneak around near a near a riffle, you can often spot them if you have good eyesight. Um, and fishing for them is a real blast. They're they're strong fighters for their size. Uh, Use an ultralight, and uh, you can have a great fun day of fishing for those. And last is the carp. Uh, this is the only fish on this list that's not a native fish. Um, but in uh, Europe and Asia, it is just the most popular sport fish there is. So it's, it's not a scorned fish everywhere. Um, it's the most popular fish overall in the world by population. Carp fishing here in the USA is a rapidly growing sport. Uh, you can see the uh, World Carp Championship came to the United States for the first time a few years back, and uh, there are more and more uh, carp tournaments happening uh, down in Texas, and, and uh, I believe there was one in Wisconsin recently. Uh, we haven't had any here, but it's only a matter of time. And uh, this fish, it may not, might not be native, but it's here, they're everywhere, we might as well enjoy them. And um, they're, they're a big, powerful fish that's often available in urban areas. I know I've had a really fun time fly fishing for these um, in the drainage ponds around housing developments right in uh, Minneapolis. I mean, you can, you can find them in, in just about any body of water and they will definitely put a bend in your rod. There's really nothing like it. Okay, so that's, that's it for the fish species and I've just got a couple of uh, slides here about eating these fish. Well, a lot, of, a lot of people rough fish purely for catch and release. Some of us also like to bring home a, a meal of fish sometime and as I said, it's, you know, a lot of these species are, are quite abundant and uh, it, it's a good source of, of protein for you and your family. Plentiful and so, in some cases underutilized. I mean, obviously I wouldn't, I wouldn't fillet up a blue sucker if I caught it. I'd probably choose to release it. But, uh, you know, for white suckers, shorthead red horse, golden red horse, they're common. So um, it, eating them should be encouraged. They're delicious. Uh, it's a low impact food. If you're worried about your ecological footprint, boy, they're uh, they're a good they're a good species to target. Uh, ways to prepare them to get around uh, some of them are bones, are uh, grinding, smoking, and pickling. You can see on the left, I got some smoked suckers. On the far right is some pickled um, fish, and then in the middle is in my mom's recipe for. Uh, ground sucker patties where you grind the fish in a meat grinder and uh, that uh, or grind the uh, the fillets take out the rib bones and grind the fillets to break up the bones and then fry them up and that dissolves the bones. Um, there's also a method I've got a, a link here to a YouTube video if you go to YouTube and 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 look up how to clean fillet sucker fish you'll see there's a big midsection in the middle of the fish that's that's boneless and what I like to do is fillet that part out and fry it and then use the bony part of the fish as uh, for fish patties. Now there's also uh, gar, if you're, if you're interested in eating gar, uh, it makes a really great fish jerky. And when I'm uh, turkey hunting or deer hunting, I like to bring jerky with me. So that's a really good uh, option for you. Here's a, this is, I have a sucker fry every year I, I host and you can see there's a meat grinder I'm using to grind up the fillets. You get a energetic kid to turn the crank for you and you're, you're all set. Grind them up and then mix them with some ingredients. Um, I'd post the recipe, but the easiest way is to just get a, and I'm not advertising this uh, seasoning, but they have a crab cake recipe on the back of those cans. And if you use that crab cake recipe, you can make a, a great tasting uh, fish cake. 
especially uh, Red Horse. They're they're really delicious. You, every everyone who I've uh, served these to have really loved them. Uh, finally, if you want more uh, more recipes or more info about uh, rough fish and all of these uh, fishes, how to how to catch them, how to eat them, obviously you can go to roughfish.com. There's a species tab there with tons of information. And here's two books that uh, I recommend. The first is Fishing for Buffalo by uh, Rob Buffler and Tom Dixon. That's the uh, Rough Fisher's Bible kind of. It's uh, just a great book with more uh, more information and recipes. And then there's also this book by Brooke Landis called American Course Angling, which uh, covers some of the uh, European uh, fishing tactics. It's a really good one to, to look for. Uh, that's all I have. Um, obviously, there, there's me with the sturgeon in the middle. Webmaster at roughfish.com is my email address. Um, don't kill and dump roughfish. I'm really happy that that made it into the fishing regulations recently. Just keep what you can use and respect the roughfish. And that's all I had today. I think we're going to go to questions. Corey, that was a, a fantastic presentation. I'm now starving. It's uh... 20 minutes to one, so I'm, I'm ready. Unfortunately, I don't have any fish in my freezer, but I'm hungry now. Thank you <laughs> for that. And I would challenge everybody. I got two challenges for you, Corey. One is I'm, I'm kind of a spam guy. I like spam. I grew up on spam. I still eat spam. But if you're ever interested in trying to figure out what spam flavor is best to catch the River Red Horse on, you mentioned they like to eat spam. I'd be willing to help you out with that project. So we could try garlic spam or whatever. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And and I'd like to challenge all our listeners too. I always brag about Minnesota. And I've I've lived in in other states, and Minnesota is just a fantastic place to live and recreate. I think, and I would challenge anybody to find another state, or probably any place in the world, really, where you can go from a long nosed sucker that's an Arctic fish, and an American eagle that's an eel. Excuse me, that's an ocean fish. And we can catch them right here in our state. I think that is, you know, just spectacular. So um, we have we have a ton of questions. I'm going to try to get through as many of these as we can. Uh, right off the bat, Jetson asked about since rough fish are for the most part not sampled on Lake Finder surveys, what's the best way to gauge the quality of the population of rough fish in that fishery? I.e., if they're looking for carp, how are they going to find good waters for that? And It's a good question um, because you're right. The uh, some of these fish don't show up very well in the uh, in the sampling gear. So I rely a lot on social media um, for that, um, but you can also talk to your uh, local DNR uh, staff um, whether or not they show up in the in the nets. The uh, local fish crew will know um, what where they find really good um, populations. And so if you can talk to some of those guys, the area office um, contact information is on the DNR website, I know. Um, so I would I would definitely talk to your local local DNR offices about it. And it's it's important to let them know too that you're interested in them because while you know our the uh, the uh, gears that they use for sampling walleye might not be good at sampling, um, you know, buffalo or 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 suckers or carp. There may be a better gear out there for doing that kind of sampling that they would use if they knew there was more interest in it. So I would encourage you to talk to them okay. um, either by email or just uh, calling them up. You know, I put some of your your links to your website and. Uh, the download for the identification cards and stuff have been put in the chat. So I encourage everybody to go look in the chat and click on those. So you have those links and um, you know, maybe uh, Cass, your one of you can put the link in the background to the DNR offices or something too up in the chat. But I know some of the fin lakes are stocked with like bullhead and stuff too, because they're great biting fish and it gives kids a good opportunity for that. So we had a lot of questions on the fly fishing. If you're fly fishing, a lot of people are in they think that's pretty cool so what cool. type of gear would you use what one, one specifically ask about catching lake fish 
by angling or fly fishing. And the other one's about carp. So I don't know how much overlap there is in equipment in those two, or could you speak to the equipment wise on that a little bit? Um, lake fish, I'm not sure what, what specifically. Lake white fish. Oh, lake white fish. Uh, yeah. Um, lake, the, the lake white fish is, it's a lot like a, like a good sized trout. So I, I mean, for gear, I would, I would look at probably a five or six weight, uh, fly rod. Um, there's it's, it's the most popular lake white fish fly fishery. And I, I know I didn't actually cover lake white fish in the, in the uh, presentation, but that's one that's sort of a rough fish too. Um, is on Devil's Track uh, Lake up in the Arrowhead. Uh, there's a there's a hatch of hexagenia mayflies that uh, happens, and uh, folks cast those big uh, mayfly gun and spinner patterns uh, during the uh, during the either the evening hatch or the uh, morning spinner fall, and and it, that can be just a blast. You're talking about big fish taking uh, hexagenia flies on top. Um, but for carp, boy, you know, a, a really, it, it can really vary because carp fisheries are so diverse. I, I know some small metro lakes where the carp you're going to run into are just a few pounds. And boy, I love fishing those with a four weight. It, it's, it's just a, it's just a blast. You will fight one for 10 or 15 minutes and, and it'll just keep spooling you every chance it gets. Um, but then, you know, you've got some of the bigger lakes and big fisheries with carp that top 30 pounds, you, you're going to need a, you know, an eight plus weight fly rod for that. So um, it, it really varies. I mean, if I had to recommend one all, overall, carp are very sensitive to being spooked by a fly line cast over them. So I, I would go on the lighter side if I had a choice, like a five weight. And then if you fun, eventually find a carp fishery with really big ones, then I would scale up, but start light. That is, does that answer the question? I think so. Yep, there's, you know, you, you talk about gear all day, so. Yeah, I sure can. Uh, John was wondering about cut bait for bullfin. How do you set it up? Do you stick it under a bobber so it's floating or do you put it more towards the bottom and split shot? Yeah, people do both. Um, I like to use a float for bullfin. Um, but, uh, and generally very little weight. So I'll use like one split shot of a fixed float. You know, usually you're fishing them in pretty shallow water, so you don't necessarily need a, a slip float, but you can use one if it's, if the water is a little deeper. Um, the, the bowfin will often take, take the bait pretty gently and move off with it. So you want a pretty light float. Um, but on the other hand, you can fish them right on the bottom. And if, if you uh, have a, uh, what's called a bait feeder or a bait runner type reel, or you can just open the spools so that the, the bowfin can take the bait, let, let it have it for, you know, 10 or 15 seconds and then, and then set the hook. Great. No, well, Bill's asking about how they taste. I think you covered a lot of that in the presentation. So Bill, if you have more specific questions, let us know. Um, Tyler had one that popped up about a particular size hook or style of hook that you use. I know we recommend circle hooks a lot. Um, you mentioned something about maybe a number two hook with a short nose. Do you have a... a... Yeah, I, I prefer circle hooks. Um, some of these species, especially if you're using a small hook, like like I said, for the uh, for shorthead red horse and some of these species that have small mouths, um, you want to use a pretty small hook. And if you're not using a circle hook and you catch a different species of fish, they can often swallow it. So I, I prefer using what's called a circle hook. Um, and these are just hooks that are sort of rounded and designed to uh, not get caught back in the fish's throat. They tend to hook the fish in the lips. So that's a great point. Um, I should add that to my presentation. Uh, you should use circle hooks when you can, um, especially if you're using uh, smaller one, smaller style hooks uh, in rivers because you you never know what you're going to catch and uh, the circle hooks really do an effective job um, of of hooking the fish yeah, a lot of lip corner hookups and stuff with circle hooks which is nice so yeah yeah and it's a lot easier too i mean if you it, the the less you handle the fish the better 
I mean, and for me too, if I'm if I'm fishing for red horse and I catch something rare like a like a black red horse or a greater red horse, I want to release that fish without a lot of handling, you know. Um, and if I'm gonna get the choice of whether I want to keep a fish or let it go, you know, if they're deep hooked, you can't do that. You you pretty much want to keep them if you if you if you hook them deeply. So I prefer to have the circle hook. Um, to help reduce hooking mortality so that I can uh, release the fish if I want to. Speaking of red horse, uh, Jeremiah was wondering about targeting red horse on a fly rod. What type of fly are you using and where are you casting to the ripples? Are you sight fishing? Um, he basically just wants to catch one on a fly rod. So any tips? Yeah. Um, a lot of the people that I know that are good at it, I'm not that great at, at I've caught a few red horse on flies. I'm not I'm not that great at it. But one of the things you need to remember about red horse is that when you approach them in a riffle in the spring, they're spawning. Like there, there will be groups of, they, they spawn in trios usually with, with two males and one female and you'll see them spawning there. They're not feeding at that point in time. They'll very occasionally take a fly then, but the really active fish are upstream from there. I know it's kind of counterintuitive. You think fish, stack up downstream and then go up to spawn but red horse are the opposite they they rest and feed above the spawning area and then swim backwards down into the ripple so if you're looking if you find visible red horse you're often going to have better luck shot an indicator fishing a nymph um upstream from the spawners because the active spawners aren't as aren't as big at feeding as the uh as the ones that are feeding and resting above it and as for flies i mean Beadhead pheasant tail is what I use almost all the time. <laughs> That's or the uh, you know there's any any buggy nymph like that will, will work for you. Hair's ear, uh, copper john is a good one. You're giving away all my all my favorites, so I don't want to wreck the staff expert list uh -oh. for later in this session. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. No, they're great flies to use. Couldn't for stay reason, season, right? Never. That's right. Uh, the red horse, this is a, a common perception, I think, that maybe you can shed some light on it, but red horse, red horse, along with a lot of other uh, roughfish species, are tend to be bottom feeders. Are they full of more pollutants and stuff than some of the other fish? Or? Uh, no, not in general. Um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, toxins in fish accumulate um, by what's called bioaccumulation, so it tends to... the the general rule is the higher on the food chain a fish is, the more toxins they accumulate. And uh, you can go on the DNR uh, website and look at uh, the uh, fish consumption advisories. These fish are not covered as much as, as some of the more popular fishes, obviously. Um, there's not as much call for it, but th that's changing. They're, more, they're being tested more and more. But a fish like a muskie or a walleye or a, or a uh, northern pike or a gar, that's a predator will accumulate more toxins than a than a uh, fish that feeds lower on the on the uh, food chain, like a sucker or a buffalo. Um, and if you think about it, what suckers eat are ninety percent of what they eat are insect larvae and crustaceans, and that's the same thing that trout eat. So it's just they they tend to live in warm water streams versus cold water streams. So as far as, as toxins and pollutants, they're about the same as trout, and they're certainly not as not as bad as uh, not or not as as heavily um, uh, have a, have as much of a toxin load as as the highly predatory fish. That's great. And and back to our we'll have to do a Chef Corey talk one of these days. But how how about bullfin and American eagle? How do they taste? Uh, I hope Maybe you mean examples. American eagle. Eel, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't speak for the eagle. Um, the uh, I've never eaten eel. Um, well, actually, I've had canned eel. Uh, I have never had fresh eel. I just, you know, I've only caught one in my entire life, um, and I let it go. I, I just it, that fish swam all the way here from New Orleans, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't, you know, I, I. It's it's a very popular food fish. I mean, I know that uh, in England it's popular. In Japan, they eat them a lot. Um, I don't know. I, I know smoked eel is really is really good. Um, 
what was the second fish? Oh, bowfin. Um, bowfin, yeah. Bowfin is popular. I know guys that eat them a lot. Um, the uh, the when I've when I've uh, I think in in fishing for buffalo, there's a creamed bowfin recipe. Um, they can be the flesh can be soft, so they're better in a pate, or um, you can treat them like a like a uh, moon eye or gold eye, um, and which means you fillet them, smoke them quite hard, and then take the flesh off and and mix it into a into a, into a spread. Um, but I encourage you to get to uh, either check out at your library or or pick up the Fishing for Buffalo book because they have a couple of good bowfin recipes in there. And if you're ever in Winnipeg, you go down to the Forks and you can get that spread there from the Golden Eye. It's a great place to try that out. I've been up there and done that. So, oh, that's great. I never have. That's yeah. wonderful. Anton was uh, wondering why weight and yellow bass are considered rough fish. Yeah, you know what? Are they considered rough fish? I I'm not sure. I, I think the uh, white bass might not be anymore. I mean, there was a time uh, when they were. I, I'd have to look at the regulations. Um, they're certainly not a traditionally targeted sport fish, and the uh, the yellow bass is so new that there's uh, no regulations on it, and I think that's changing this year. So this is always in flux, and again, I. Uh, I know this is changing. Like the regulations for this year are are going to be different from last year, um, and next year, you know, there there may be other fish categorized um, as as rough fish or not. Um, the yellow bass are still uh, fairly unknown, so they're just being. I know that the DNR is studying what to do with the regulations for them, and. It's likely that they and the uh, white bass are going to have, you know, a game fish regulation on them in the near future. So you're right; uh, they're yeah. they're probably not not uh, probably should take them out of the out of this presentation. But I really love fishing for them, so <laughs> put them in there. Great, Louise. Thanks for the comment. A fabulous presentation. Uh, speaking of regulations, Bill was wondering he can fish for rough year rough fish year round, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I don't believe there's any. Uh, yeah, you can you can hook and line fish for rough fish year round. Um, so, you know, you can fish for burbot in January. You can fish for red horse before the, uh, you know, before the game fish openers and uh, all throughout the summer and fall. Great. We're running short on time, but we're going to keep going for a little bit and see if we can get through these last few questions here. But Anton lives down town Minneapolis or near Minneapolis, um, looking at the Mississippi River. He's wondering how to read the river to specifically target carp. He's looking for a good spot to go where he increases chances. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Mississippi River, I look for slower current and mud flats like sand or soft bottom, shallow water. Um, so <clears throat> areas that are off the main current. Um, They'll, or near or deeper areas near current and near shallow water. I know that's hard to, it's, I'm not being very clear, but uh, they, they like to cruise shallow flats looking for uh, insects in the mud. Um, and they uh, like to have refuge from the current. So if you find an eddy or a current break, or uh, sometimes the, if you find a river bend, they'll be um, hanging out on the inside of the bend. If you have, if you, uh, you have a choice whether to fish the inside or the outside. I would pick the inside. Okay, great. Uh, just, uh, Judson had a question about water temperature. You know, a lot of people are out there checking the temperature of the water for seeing how the fish are going to be activated mm -hmm. or how active they're going to be. You said you never mentioned that. So you're basing your decisions on fish you're targeting off the calendar as opposed to the water temperature. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, there, yeah, there are water temperature indicators that you can use. Um, and if you carry a thermometer with you and uh, have the uh, information about the spawning temperatures, that's a, that's a fantastic tool. And that really, I really should have added, added that to the presentation. Um, the other way that you can, that you can predict these uh, spawning migrations and uh, fish activity is through phenology, what's called phenology. Which means you look at other things that are happening in nature, um, and I'm I'm an avid forager and 
and, and hunters. So I go, you know, when the uh, morel mushrooms are coming out, I know that the red horse are just starting to spawn. There's also, you know, when you see the lilac trees start to bloom, um, that's an indicator too. Um, so if you do a Google search for phenology, you can often find indicators of what's going on in the world at that time. And uh, you can key in on that for uh, predicting what, uh, when these fish are going to uh, be active. So those are two ways you can do it. Um, obviously, the the thermometer is the more accurate way to do it. Great. So I, there was another question here about the books that you had on the end of your slideshow. There, um, I don't. I didn't see a link to those, but could you oh. mention those again, or maybe we could put those in the chat? So yeah. So the first one is Fishing for Buffalo um, by Rob Buffler and Tom Dixon. That's, uh, I think it's on Amazon, or, um, you know, or you can find it at a bookstore. I didn't really want to link to retailer directly. Um, there we go, Fishing for Buffalo. Um, and then uh, the second one is American Course Angling by Brooke Landis. L-A-N-D-I-S-S, -S, I believe, which is, uh, it's an alternate, I mean, it, it kind of opens up your mind to a different style of fishing, which is uh, really kind of an interesting uh, take on it. He's really a good sucker fisherman and has some, uh, he's good at float fishing for them, which is a, a style that's not often used in, in America for, for suckers, but uh, it's, uh, I find float fishing for suckers is, is very visual and very fun and engaging. So uh, if you think you might have fun with that, that's a good book to check out too. But if you want recipes, you gotta get uh, fishing, fishing for Buffalo because Brooke Landis is catch and release only. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. And I know we just went over the one o'clock hour here. We still have over 60 people on here. And I still got a few questions to go through if you're willing to stick around for a couple of minutes and uh, Eric had a great one. And, and this is, we talked about this in the past because as a kid growing up, people, you know, rough fish weren't something you caught and kept. Um, his question is, can you release rough fish if you don't want to keep them? I think we kind of answered that in the program, but it's a great misconception. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a long standing misconception. Yes, you can always release any fish you catch if you don't want to, if you don't want to keep it. Um, <clears throat> If you're, the misconception comes from old regulations um, that said, if you spear or bow shoot fish, you can't return them to the water. But if you catch them by angling, yes, you can certainly release them. Great. Uh, and Bishop was wondering, big mouth buffalo, I know this has come up a few times and they're doing some research on this, but um, is the research done with big mouth buffalo especially but really any sucker will sometimes take a lure like a blade bait or a jig when they typically only eat very small organisms. Is there a way to do this? Is there a way to do this intentionally or is it purely a chance that they're doing this? Oh, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. It happens, <laughs> it happens all the time. And if I could get that to happen on purpose, I would, I would love to be able to do that, but I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet. I'm still trying. Um, if you fish around a lot of them, that's going to happen occasionally. Um, otherwise, boy, it's it's difficult to get them to take a to take a bait. Fly rod is a great way to go after them, uh, or a, or just a uh, a fly type setup on a spinning rod um, makes it easier with a tiny bait. But yeah, they will take a they'll take a blade bait. They'll take an inline spinner, or a uh, you know a rooster tail or a small curly tail jig. I mean, white curly tail jigs are are one of the mainstays for catching big mouth buffalo, and there's too many of them are caught in those for it to be completely chance. But I don't know what gets in their head and makes them take that, but it does happen for sure. Something they don't like about it, and they just want to eat it, huh? Yeah, you know, you might be right. It might be just a like a reaction strike, like a like a spawning steelhead or salmon will just smack at a lure, even though they don't want to eat it they just get irritated by it and want to want to bite it at out of irritation that's a good point uh mitch was wondering and we talked a little bit about uh cut bait but if rough fish are reclassified as game fish such as sucker or sheephead will that change the rules for allowing them for use as cut bait 
since some game fish are not allowed since game fish are not allowed to be used as bait in Minnesota. So I would assume that would be the case, right? Yeah, I would assume so too. I would assume so too. Um, and I think everything that's classified as a minnow would like, for instance, bullheads are both classified as minnows or, or is it suckers that are classified as small suckers are classified as minnows and uh, larger ones are as rough fish. Um, so you'll have to read the, I mean, if they change, if the regulations get changed to convert some of these fish uh, from rough fish to game fish, you're going to have to go over the regulations, uh, read them in detail. I, I know I read them every year and uh, make sure I understand what's going on. And if you do have a, have a question, feel free to call enforcement. I mean, either call your local CEO or, uh, you know, you can call the info line at the DNR and they'll, if they can't answer your question, they'll, they'll track down the answer with the appropriate person and get back to you. They're very good about that. Yes, uh, their the info center is great. So they've, uh, they've called us on a couple things that we've stated wrong or given a wrong impression with on this, which is, is good. So, uh, and Tamara, thanks for the story about her father-in-law and brothers that used to have contracts with the state to go out and they'd seen for rough fish and they'd sell them out east because they're considered a delicacy out there, so. Yeah, that's totally true. It's, uh, and honestly, if you go to uh, the Huangshu Market on University in St. Paul, they're, uh, they have big mouth buffalo selling for 10 bucks a pound. So it's, uh, they're popular food fishes, even, you know, even right here. Uh, Tom asked in the chat, I think we got through all the questions in the Q&A. There's a couple in the chat that came in, but uh, Tom was wondering, are they ever out of season? I think we covered that. They're not. Um, do you need a fishing license? You still do need a fishing license if you're... 16 and older, correct? Yep, you sure do. Um, um, the other thing is, if you're fishing in designated trout water, you can't fish um, out of trout season. That's one thing to remember. Even if you're just fishing for suckers, you can't you can't um, fish trout water outside of trout season. So that's the only caveat to the seasons. Um, and you wouldn't, even if you're fishing for suckers, if it's designated trout water, you still need a trout stamp to fish that water. Great, good point. So, I, I think we got them all, Corey. So, again, thank right. you for a fantastic presentation. I'm hungry for fish now and getting excited for the spring season to roll around here once it stops snowing and raining outside. Yeah. So, um, let's get out. I'll bring the spam. Sounds good. I think with that, I'm going to end the recording here and we'll pop into the back room.